I'm running off of two hours of sleep and we have fifth level spells to cover. Let's get into it, folks. Hello there, everyone, and welcome back down here to the Gamer's Den with me, your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire, where I'm growing increasingly unkempt yet again, and also running off of very minimal bits of sleep as we race around to get so many different things done in professional life, home life, taking care of small, wee, little ones, and also making sure everything just kind of functions like it's supposed to. Today, we are getting into the fifth level spell for the first edition Pathfinder Mages. And they got a couple of interesting ones, but they are spells that are useful across a lot of different arcane spellcasting classes. So it's not anything especially unique here. And in fact, there's actually a fair number of spells on their list that while they might be excellent or even great for a wizard or a summoner, they're really not going to work out all that well for the mages. But before we get into all of that, if you're new here to the channel, then go on down there, hit the subscribe button, and become a regular member here at the Gamer's Den. Or if you've already gone on ahead and listed yourself on just such an absolutely incredible roster of legendary heroes, then go on down to hit the like button and share the video far and wide. Now we'll go ahead and kind of start diving into things here. So for your fifth level spells, the first one I would recommend picking up is Overland Flight. No, it's not a combat spell, but it is one that is going to be a significant amount of utility for you. Give yourself the ability to fly for one hour per caster level, absolutely staggering duration, at 40 feet speed or 30 feet in medium or heavy armor, or if you are carrying a medium load with a bonus on fly checks equal to one half your level. At long distance, you can hustle without taking non-lethal damage for a total of 64 miles over an eight hour flying period. So that's going to be absolutely incredible. Although remember, if you're carrying a medium load or in medium or heavier armor, that travel time is going, well, that distance rather, is going to be reduced. Next, we have Wall of Force. It's a classic. It's still very much so useful for you here. You can use this to create a Wall of Force within 25 feet plus 5 feet every two levels of you. That's the range that you have to work with, with an area of 10 feet per caster level, with 30 hardness and 20 hit points per caster level. This can be dispelled with Mage's Disjunction, and also Disintegrate will deal significant damage to this. However, this is still going to be an incredibly durable wall. This is going to give you a significant amount of battlefield control if you and the party wizard, or if there's another arcane spellcaster, are laying this out on the battlefield, you can do so much to cut off your enemies. Just bear in mind that if you're just making a regular wall, flying enemies will be able to circumvent this. Uh, it's not a, it's not an opaque wall either, so there's still going to be some line of sight issues. So teleportation, dimension door, those kind of spells will be able to help bypass it. However, if your opponent is having to burn those kinds of spells in order to get around and get to you, I'd say that's probably still a worthwhile, uh, worthwhile result for you to achieve. So this is going to be a pretty useful one. Next, we come to Wall of Stone. Create a stone wall up to one five foot square per level within 100 feet plus 10 feet per caster level. The wall will be one inch thick every four caster levels, so not incredibly thick, but you can use this to make walls, bridges, crude defenses, stairs. So not only is this great defense and more battlefield control, but it's also a means of utility. You can use this to bridge gaps, to create stairways up uh, through otherwise impassable terrain. Create handholds for yourself. Now, what exactly you're able to do, you're not going to be able to make precise, finely wrought things. You're not going to make anything with that kind of precision, but check with your DM to see what they're willing to let you do, because 
if you can make a bridge or stairs, steps and the like, well, I think it'd be conceivable that you could make handholds to make climbing up a wall much easier without making it obvious that the wall is deforming or now has steps jutting out of it. So there's a lot that you can do with this. And, you know, it's always nice to just be able to make a quick wall with some crenellations, matriculations, things like that, and give yourself a bit of a cover bonus to your defense as well. Next is Cloud Kill. This is one that is actually a really good spell in many ways, but for you, eh, you know, it's not, again, it's not bad, but this is probably one that's going to be better for a wizard. You pick an area within 100 feet plus 10 feet per caster level, and for one minute per caster level, a 20 foot high gaseous cloud spreads in a 20 foot radius, similar to the fog cloud spell. Um, but auto-killing any creature with three hit dice or less. Four or five hit dice have to make a fortitude save or die. On success, they take 1d4 con damage per round in the cloud. Six hit dice or more take 1d4 con damage each round. A fortitude save does reduce this by half, and it's a standard action to cast, so that's going to eat into your movement and your ability to make your attack actions and the like, but this is still going to be pretty significant because, sure, three hit dice creatures by the time you get fifth level spells, you're what, level 10, level 12, somewhere in there? Those creatures individually are not going to be a great threat to you. However, if there's a group of them, say you have uh, five three hit dice creatures and then a six hit dice creature, well, if those five three hit dice creature spend their actions doing eight another to give their uh, uh, to give the six hit dice creature bonuses to their attack as well as provide flanking bonuses that makes that six, uh, six hit dice creature much more likely to be able to hit you not only that but if they just start swarming you if you have a good dexterity score which if you're following this guy you should and say you picked up the combat reflexes feat or have some other means of accessing uh, additional attacks of opportunity then those creatures can just rush right in and eat those attacks of opportunity literally burying you in their bodies to give the more significant threat creatures a chance to get at you surround you and start dealing damage to you so this is going to be good for clearing out low threat creatures if you're dealing with significant numbers of them four to five hit dice creatures those are definitely more of a threat but they get to make fortitude saves or die and there's going to be plenty of creatures that have some solid fortitude saves. Maybe not all of them are going to be succeeding against your spell save DC, but they're still going to stand a better chance. Same for six hit dice creatures or higher. But the fact that they take constitution damage is pretty nice, and it's a constitution, it's a fortitude save that they have to roll each round that they are trapped within this gaseous cloud. So you can really start to chip away at their constitution score because if they take four points of constitution damage, that's two points of constitution modifier for a six hit dice creature. That's 12 hit points that you subtracted right there, as well as penalties to their fortitude saves. So they are going to become increasingly vulnerable the longer that they're in this cloud. However, if they're smart, they're not going to stick around in there. So there's some pros and cons to this, but another thing to note with the spell description, this moves 10 feet away from you. 10 feet away from you each round and also the vapors are much more dense than the air around them so they're naturally going to sink down through the floor so if there's a hole in the ground leading to an area that's occupied by several opponents that dropping this spell down through there is going to deal relentless amounts of damage killing several so this can be an incredibly effective spell but the maximum effectiveness is going to require a bit of foresight, planning, circumstance, 
uh, in order to come together and create an opportunity to really make good use of its benefits. And bear in mind, you're not a full progression spellcaster. You're not going to have the same range of spell slots, and so you may be more tempted to take all the lower level touch spells and use metamagic feats to boost those. And then we come to a spell that I would really recommend against taking, and that's Geyser. Although I should mention that I don't rate this as poorly as several other guides have, or other community boards and discussion threads. This does fire damage, 3d6, already not great for a 5th level spell. Target can take fall damage after being launched on a failed reflex save. This does have a long range at 400 feet per caster level or 400 feet plus 40 feet per caster level, rather, uh, the target has to enter the designated target five foot square. So it's not something that you can auto hit with unless you are directly targeting right underneath your opponent. Now, uh, the other thing is droplets of scalding water can deal damage, 1d6 fire damage, in a radius equal to half the geyser height to any creature in that area. What, what's the geyser height? It's 10 feet every two caster levels. So let's just say level 10, you're looking at 50 feet. So that's 5d6 points of fall damage plus 3d6 points of fire damage. The fall damage is nice, but it's 5d6 for a fifth level spell. And the 1d6 fire damage doesn't really do a whole lot for you because as I keep banging on about, fire resistance and fire immunity are the most common immunity and resistance types that you're going to find in Pathfinder. And to top it off, it's a very minor area of effect beyond the 1d6 points of damage you can deal each round with this. I mean, this is pretty bad, except for in some situations, but that's an incredible amount of circumstance to have come up. So if you're on a wall, you can use this on a horizontal surface um, and use this to create geysers. If you're in a cavern system, if you're in a cave and there are uh, stalagmites hanging from the ceiling and you can launch the target up into those, that's an opportunity to deal damage there. And when they fall, they fall in a random area in the radius prone, so rendering a target prone can be useful, but again, by the time you get access to the spell, they're making reflex saves to avoid this, to avoid being launched into the air, to reduce the damage, and it's just... It's not great. It's not a great spell. There are some circumstances where this might be okay, but really that's going to take a lot of work, and I might be rating this... I could be rating this a bit generously because at 10th level you're going to have opponents that can reasonably avoid this, so it's it's just not very good. Not without a fair bit of work on your part and perhaps a little bit of contrivance on your DM's part. And there are plenty of other spells that don't work so great here. Um, you know, Elemental Body 2 as another example. It's a continuation of Elemental Body 1. It's worth skipping for you. Uh, Kona Cold, again, not bad. It definitely has a decent range. It's a cone area of effect, so you can catch several opponents. And while Cold is still a relatively common resistance and immunity type, it's not as bad as Fire is by any stretch of the imagination. But even still, it's a 5th level blasting spell. It's Again, it's not bad, but you don't have quite as many spell slots to work with as a wizard might. But what do you think? Go on down to the comments below and let me know your thoughts. Did you like today's video? Did you dislike it? What other spells might you recommend or would you warn against for your fellow players out there? And remember, if you're new here to the channel, go on down there, hit the subscribe button, and become a regular member here at the Gamer's Den. With all that said, I've been your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. Thank you all so very much for your time. Good gaming to you all. And you all have yourselves a good night.